Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Today is Monday, March 1st, start of a brand new month, and uh, we've almost completed a year of uh, updates on the Westchester coronavirus uh, pandemic report. Uh, today we're here to give you the first of two reports for the week. We'll be back again on Thursday at 2 o'clock. I'm joined, as I always am, by a Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins, who will be reporting on a couple of key issues. And uh, in a little while, we're going to bring on uh, one of our guests, uh, Village Mayor Gina Pickenich from the village uh, town of Mount Kisco. And we're very happy to have Mayor Pickenich here. We were together over the weekend. We'll touch on that and uh, the work that's going on in Mount Kisco. She'll give you an update on that community. And we do try to ask our various municipal partners to join us when it's possible so they can tell you what's happening in the different corners of the county. Mount Kisco is uniquely an important community because it really serves as a hub community for the whole northeastern section of uh, Westchester County, the various towns and other communities up there. So we're very happy that Mayor Pickenich is going to be with us in a second. Uh, we'll start with the numbers uh, on our uh, uh, COVID database. Uh, the, the dashboard, we understand, is not yet updated to show weekend numbers. I'm going to provide numbers that came from the state as of Sunday, uh, February 28th. There'll probably be an update by the time I finish the report on the state tracker. So uh, you may see some different numbers just a little later if you go onto the state tracker. We'll get the county tracker up to date so you can uh, it can correlate with the numbers that I'll be giving now, and may, perhaps the numbers that come from the state updated. As of today, or as of Sunday, I should say, we have 5,976 active cases of coronavirus. That's on the basis of 107,487 cases to date and 101,511 that have gone through the two-week uh, incubation period and successfully passed it through. We have tested uh, 2,082,716 coronavirus tests, more than two tests per person. And while we may not have tested every man, woman, and child in the county once, we certainly have had any number of people that have been tested multiple times to get to that number. Um, the numbers that uh, we have here uh, on uh, the number of cases at the 5976 mark is a five-week continued drop from the peak that we saw on Sunday, January 24th of 11,494 active cases. So to go from 11,494 active cases down to 5,976 cases is very good progress. Now, uh, there's always a little up and down over the course of a week. Uh, we might go on a particular day to another day and have 100 cases kick up or 100 so forth cases kick down. But in general, there's been a steady downward trend over that period of time. I think we can say safely there was no uptick from Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, and we were concerned about that. We thought that there might be some outgrowth for that, but that has not been the case now as we've passed the cohort of Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, we don't know if the Golden Globes is going to have an uptick, but we don't think that's going to be the case. Um, the, the hospitalization numbers that we have now, our most recent numbers as of Friday, we're down to 340 individuals that are hospitalized. Uh, and uh, when we looked at our numbers a week ago, uh, last Monday, we were at 385, so that's already a drop of 45 people. And if you go back again, the respective five weeks from what seemed to be the peak of the second uh, bell curve, uh, we're, uh, we're showing a significant drop, 562 hospitalized, now down to 340 hospitalized. So that's a good sign. And um, we, uh, we continue to look at the total number of active cases, and then that's the breadth of infection. The depth of infection is how many people are hospitalized. And so those two numbers have both been in a downward trend. Uh, the number of fatalities has risen to 2,097, almost to the 2,100 mark. I assume that uh, when we see numbers for uh, today, Monday, once they're posted, we'll be over the 2,100 2, mark. We have um, been, uh, been losing less people a week. That's cold comfort for the people that lost a loved one. Uh, there is no way to calculate that, that human loss. Uh, but in terms of what's happening statistically from the pandemic, we are, we are having less fatalities uh, recently than we've had in previous times. We're in single-digit fatalities. Uh, and there were days uh, fairly recently where we had 10, 11, 12 fatalities. And then, of course, in the peak of the pandemic almost a year ago, we saw nights that were hideous, 30, 40 people dying in a night. Uh, but as it stands now, the, um, uh, the news is good, but by no means terrific. And we'll see how much more those numbers can continue to drop over the course of the next couple of weeks. 
the, uh, the, the, the leverage balance on this as the number of infections go down is what the number of vaccinations are and how that rises. And the more the vaccinations rise, the less likely it is that a person will get a disease. So from day to day, we should be testing and getting less positives total than we did uh, the, the two-week cycle before. And that's what really affects the total number of active cases. Uh, a number of vaccinations, this is total number of vaccinations, not individuals, because their first and second shots included in this number for some people. Some got their first shot or waiting for the second shot. Some got their first shot at the beginning of the vaccine period and now have had their second shots. But in total, the county center, which is the single largest place of vaccination in Westchester County, has vaccinated 74,757 uh, vaccinations in the aggregate. The, uh, the next largest area are the two county clinics, the White Plains uh, Public Health Clinic here in downtown White Plains and uh, on Court Street and the Westchester Community College branch, which we opened up a couple of weeks ago. In the aggregate, they have uh, issued 13,000 906 vaccinations. Those are the two largest, 74,000 at the county center, almost 14,000 through the two county clinics, and that totals 88,663 vaccinations. Um, you take that and you add it to all of the different pharmacies that have been giving out vaccinations, the, the hospitals, medical centers have been giving out vaccinations, primarily to people within the hospital family, but uh, workers and, and others that are critical. And then the pop-ups, which I'm going to talk about, which are temporary vaccination locations that are established by the state of New York with partners uh, involved in that. Uh, the, the, the total number of vaccinations now uh, exceed 120,000 vaccinations, and uh, that number is rising every day. We're doing 1,000 a day in uh, plus at the county center. We're doing 300 plus a day, more than that in the, in the county clinics. And coming online, is the Yonkers site, which is a FEMA state cooperative site, which we expect and hope will be the equal of the county center site. So when that comes online, if that's another 1,000 a day, then we're going to start to be moving uh, more aggressively in the right direction. There has been um, more vaccine available through the federal government uh, than was true a month ago, and we hope that number is going to continue to grow. We're all aware that uh, on Friday the FDA approved the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a one-shot vaccination that's helpful in terms of the logistics of vaccinations. So people don't who take the Johnson & Johnson shot do not have to come back for the second shot. Those on Pfizer and Moderna do. Um, so the signs are hopeful, and, and they're moving in the right direction, but we're nowhere as near out of this thing yet. And I think we want to be measured and careful because we're still going to have to wear masks. We're still going to have to socially distance. And we're still going to have to do prudent things. But if we do those things, we can avoid an outbreak. A couple of weeks ago, uh, after the state uh, asked the counties to make these decisions, we were able to authorize high school sports across the board. So sports like football, uh, ice hockey, basketball that were not permissible previously were, uh, were started underway. Now we've started to have competition in those sports. And at this point, we have not seen an increase, a significant increase in the spike of, um, of vaccines, uh, pardon me, of infection. And, and that infection rate is what we're watching to determine the policies we take. If we, take a, if we make a decision and we open something up and we watch it to determine if it spreads the infection. And if it does not, we continue. If it does, we, uh, we step back and, and shut it down. So, so far, we've not had to do that. And we're very encouraged that with each of these steps that we're taking, we're taking steps in the right direction. But uh, there is a ways to go. I just want to highlight that this weekend, particularly on Saturday, I took the time to drive around the county uh, to look at four of the pop-up centers. And the pop-up center uh, is, in essence, a temporary vaccination center, which is authorized by the state of New York. And they identify a health care partner and a community partner together to work on getting a certain number of vaccines out to people in a particular cohort in a particular community. The center that we have in the county center, you know, serves people all across the county and outside Westchester County that can come. But not everybody has the transportation, not everybody has the physicality to be able to, uh, to come to a central site. There are parts of this county that are 20, 25 miles away from White Plains, and so it's not right outside the front door. And even people who are closer in mileage just might not have the, the presence. They'll think of going to White Plains as being a particularly... Uh, uh, extensive trip. And so we want to try to avoid that. And the state has, in the short term, created these pop-up centers with, a, as I said, a very targeted audience that they're trying to reach. 
Of the four that I had the opportunity to see over uh, over the weekend, one of them was one that was in the uh, in the village of Mount Kisco, that was done at the Mount Kisco Senior Center. And when Mayor Pickenich speaks, she'll talk a little bit more about that. But it was a partnership between the village's senior programs. They identified individuals who were eligible to take the vaccine. It worked in concert with the Neighbors Link program, which reaches out uh, to those in the immigrant community and the Hispanic community of Mount Kisco, and then also a partnership with uh, Northwell medical, which is the parent association for the Northern Westchester Medical uh, Hospital facility. So Derek Anderson was there and Carola Bracco was there. Real partnership between the village and uh, some of these other organizations. And uh, she'll talk a little bit about what she saw while she was there. And she and I were there. Other elected officials, County Legislator Kitley Koval, uh, also um, Assemblyman Chris Burdick was there. And uh, we also had uh, the good fortune of New York Secretary of State uh, Rosanna Rosado, who was there, and she got her vaccine shot, and uh, it uh, it was a good step forward in that particular location. We were also uh, I was also at the Kylie Youth Center on Main Street in Peekskill, and at the No Dine Hill Community Center in Yonkers. Both of those locations were second dose administration for people who had gotten their first dose three weeks previously. Ken Jenkins was very involved in the No Dine Hill uh, Community Center project, uh, and I had stopped by the Kylie Youth Center three weeks ago when they had the first round of shots, and that was New York Presbyterian um, a Network with Hudson Valley Hospital that put that together, along with um, uh, the active community in Peekskill, with city and the housing authority and so forth. And then I also stopped by the Theodore Young Community Center in uh, Greenberg, which is not very far from here, and they had a, uh, a vaccination center, which were first shots that were administered to people in that community. In each of these pop-ups, Ken is going to get into this in a little bit more detail. Each of these pop-ups are designed to reach people who would otherwise be difficult to reach under the normal circumstances. They are not open to the public. In fact, none of these vaccination places are, you know, open up a shingle, come up, get online, and get a shot. Uh, if we had enough uh, vaccines available to do that, we would do that. But we don't at this stage of the game. So the state is requiring people to register, to go through a process. And as again, as Ken will outline, how that's segmented is part of the governor's uh, uh, direction in order to use that quantity that we receive in as productive way as possible. Now, when, uh, when some of these um, centers are done, whether they're the pop-up links or some of the targeted things that we're doing in the county, there is a link <clears throat> that an individual is given. And they may be given that link because they're a senior citizen, because of comorbidity, uh, perhaps they're in an occupational cohort that entitles them to get the vaccine. It's very important to understand this. You cannot give that link out to somebody else. Let me repeat that so we're clear. You get a link that allows you to make a connection for an appointment for you to get the vaccine. Why? Because you fall into an age eligibility, you fall into an underlying health eligibility, you fall into an occupational uh, eligibility, police, fire, EMS, uh, there's a host of uh, areas that fit that category. You can't give it to your cousin. You cannot give it to your spouse. The effort is being made to target individuals by basis of one of those factors, and that's how the New York program has worked. And uh, what happens is when you give it to your cousin, to be you know slightly facetious about this, because your cousin wants it, then you're denying somebody who needs that vaccine more, someone who falls into a, a underlying health disease and someone who is in a situation of, of age that could affect their vulnerability to COVID. So it's very important if you're in a situation where you get a link, you use that link. We will turn people away from the vaccination site if they show up and they're not eligible. And they may say, oh, well, I got an appointment because I got the link. But if you're not eligible under one of the eligibility categories, we have to turn you away. State is very insistent about this, and it also is, is simply what's right. At this stage of the game, I delayed you know, taking my first shot because I knew that people needed it more. And you have to have the people who are the most vulnerable get that opportunity for the vaccine. So please, if you get the link, it's not for you to share with your family or your friends or anybody else. Um, you're getting the link for a particular reason why you qualify for the shot, and that's the way we have to pursue it uh, as we go forward. As we, um, as we look at some of these situations, um, aside from the, uh, the difficulty of all of this to, to uh, make an appointment, 
We recognize right now that we have, at this moment in time, demand that exceeds supply. It's as simple as that. There are people who have some frustration. They might go to a particular center at a particular time and have a line, and they're not happy to be on a line. No one wants to be on a long line. I don't want you to be on a long line. Uh, some people will find it difficult to get an appointment. The core root of all of these things is not any kind of administrative uh, um, uh, in inability to function properly. It is lack of supply to meet the demand. It's very simple. If you see that uh, there's a product in the marketplace and you go down to get it, you know, come on down. The first 15 people get a 20% discount uh, and you're the 16th person to come down. The product is off the shelf. It's gone. And it doesn't matter, you know, that, that you wanted it at that discounted price. There was only so many of those units that they were to give out, and those were done. And that's a standard reality in retailing. And so that's what we face in this situation. It will get better with each passing week. It's getting better. And as soon as we have enough supply, then things will change in the distribution. You won't have to worry about these things, and we may be able to open it up in a more broad basis. We know that the vast majority of residents, Westchester, New York State, USA residents, are not yet eligible for the shot. And so when it, it opens up for everybody, it's going to be a bit of a madhouse. So we have to be sure that we've got the supply that can satisfy the full demand of the society. For right now, the demand is clustered into those categories, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. Uh, Ken Jenkins, uh, who our deputy county executive, has been uh, with us every step of the way as we make decisions as part of a team. And I want him to go into the sort of breakdown of how the state envisions different sources of vaccination being targeted for different audiences of people. Ken? Thanks, Joyce. Um, and, and as the county executive has uh, talked through several times, the most important question everyone has right now is when am I going to be eligible to, to get the shot? And as New York State has identified for all of those locations that are out there, who should be vaccinated at what time in those particular sites? And again, it's confusing because on one side we say you only can get that link by going to the MI eligible website. That's the state website. Um, it's kind of the entree door to be able to determine whether or not you're eligible for a vaccine or not. Um, and then say, well, if you have a link that's directly sent to you, you can't share that link. And that's part of the challenges. So we have the New York State run sites. So that's the MI eligible link or call one 833 Six nine seven four eight two nine. Once again, eight three three six nine seven four eight two nine. Um, and the state-run sites will take usually everyone that's eligible in a particular location. So one A or one B eligibility. Um, that includes essential workers, people over sixty-five, and some individuals with comorbidities. So some state-run sites have geographic limitations. For example, the county executive pointed out the new site that's coming online in Yonkers on March 3rd. That site is right now limited to being able to make appointments by the zip code. And, and people have put into the chat on Facebook, um, had questions last time, and it is specific. Until 3 o'clock, until 8 o'clock in the morning on March 3rd, then it will open up to all of the zip codes in Westchester County. And it is only for eligible people. So it's not just you live in Westchester and you want the vaccine. Thank you for correcting me on, in the chat that it is for people that are 1A or 1B eligible, which means 65 or older, comorbidity or specific op occupations. That FEMA site is gonna be open again on the 3rd, that's Wednesday, for, with, for people that are in those six zip codes, the seven zip codes in Yonkers, and in Mount Vernon. Then, again, everyone in Westchester will be able to um, register if you're eligible. And keep in mind, again, just because you got an appointment, as the county executive pointed out, if you're not eligible, they will reject you, right? And that's hard, especially how hard it is to get an appointment. You feel challenged, you know, to walk through the door, and it's not a pleasant conversation. No one wants to tell someone, oh, no, we're not going to be able to vaccinate you because you're not eligible. But that's going to continue to happen as long as the supply remains in the condition it is. It is definitely improving, as the county executive pointed out, and we're, we're moving forward with that. The pharmacies, the pharmacies get their vaccine from both New York State and from the federal government directly. 
they are targeted right now to people with that are 65 years and older. You need to schedule your appointment directly with those individuals. So if you go to the MI eligible website, you will see that pharmacy listed in that particular location for 65 years or older, and you need to directly contact them to schedule an appointment. Some of the pharmacies go through their, their main list of, of, of their patients and people that are participating there and have reached out, but once again, you should do that. On our website, we do point out the vaccine shipments that we get for the week. And when we do that, um, it shows the number of vaccines per one of those locations. Pharmacies, I haven't seen a pharmacy get more than 100, 200 vaccines in a week. And that's a, a challenge because there's many, many more people that want to have the vaccine, that, that are eligible for the vaccine, that want the vaccine, but there's just not the supply to go around. The pop-ups, as the county executive pointed out, New York State's been working with targeted groups to be able to, you know, churches, health centers, community organizations with a medical partner and the, the state being able to do these pop-up sites. They're temporary. There isn't any place to sign up for them. Those folks get reached out to directly, um, and whether it's municipal housing in Yonkers or up in Peekskill or community centers or church groups, it is really targeting a cohort of individuals to do that. So if you hear about the pop-up, don't just show up. It doesn't work. If you don't have an appointment, it's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to get through the door, even if you're eligible. And that's the hardest part in all of this. The Westchester County run clinics, that is here in, in White Plains at the health center and the Westchester Community College, have been focusing on one be essential workers as required by the state of New York. They're working directly with those folks and groups to schedule for those workers, the essential workers, et cetera. However, we did identify today that we are getting a shipment for people that are 65 years or older. So for this week only, for right now, that we're going to have at 4 p.m. today on the MI eligible web link, um, the appointments should open up for Wednesday and Thursday for the um, for our county clinic that's being run out of um, the Westchester Community College. So around four o'clock, it could be a little bit before, could be a little bit after, it's not the county's website that's doing that. Those appointments should open up and there'll be 900 of those appointments between the two days, 450 on one day, 450 on the other. Best of luck to everyone trying to um, get those appointments in. And with that, again, make sure that you follow the rules as going on the website. There's no question that we would love for everyone to have a vaccine right away, as the county executive said, in every corner of the county, as has been noted previously, but the vaccine supply is challenging all of us at this point in time. Please, please show the patients, and we'll be able to work through this together. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Ken. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, we will be posting on our website uh, the week 12 allocations, which we just received the information, which of these pharmacies, uh, quite a number of Walgreens pharmacies in Westchester County, and then some of the independent pharmacies uh, that they'll be getting. As Ken pointed out, the vast majority of these individuals, uh, individual pharmacies are getting between 100 to 200 doses. There are a couple of exceptions, but uh, by and large, that's roughly uh, the effort that the state is making to try to spread the, the vaccine distribution into different types of locations to reach a diverse population. If everybody went to one location centrally, it would benefit those by geography, perhaps by economic or demographic advantage, uh, but by spreading it out in this fashion and with the pop-up centers, you're reaching more of the diversity of Westchester County. And again, I believe that's gonna be up on our uh, dashboard uh, fairly soon, so you'll be able to see what that is. Westchester County in the Hudson region for week 12 uh, is getting um, an additional uh, normal situation of 2,500 uh, dose allocations. And of course, we're above those other counties in the Hudson Valley, we're a larger county. And then we get the supplement of 900 doses. So we'll have 3,400 doses to work with. That does not satisfy the universal demand, but it does make a step in the right direction. And we just wanna highlight again, we are currently still in phases 1A and 1B, all been laid out by the, uh, by the state uh, governor and uh, his uh, departments uh, of health and related departments. Uh, you go on to the COVID-19 uh, website and you'll look for what Ken just said, the vaccine hotline number, the vaccine form number, 
all of the various things for am I eligible, what I need to know, all of those kind of things are available for you to take a look at. Uh, today being uh, Monday the 1st, on Wednesday, March 3rd, we are going to have a, uh, an event that uh, commemorates the one-year anniversary of COVID-19 in Westchester County. This is a somber commemoration. It is not a celebration. Uh, we've lost, as I've just mentioned, over 2,000, almost 2,100 Westchester residents. But uh, we do want to take note of the one-year anniversary of this. Uh, no one imagined, even a year ago, that we would be entering into this kind of a situation and what the ramifications would be, and they've been extensive and severe. But uh, on that date, uh, on March 3rd, 11 o'clock in the morning, here in the lobby of the county office building, 148 Martin Avenue in downtown White Plains, uh, we will have an interfaith prayer vigil, uh, and we have stored for the winter the ribbons of remembrance is here. Uh, they will return to Lenoir Preserve uh, as soon as the weather gets a little bit better. We're all hoping this is March now that we'll see better weather within the course of the next month. Uh, we will have, after the Interfaith Prayer Vigil, a moment of silence at noon. This is this Wednesday, March 3rd, the one-year anniversary, a moment of silence that we, uh, we intend to expred, uh, express countywide. Flags will be flown at half-staff during this period of time, and then uh, there'll be the ringing of the bells countywide after the moment of silence, and then uh, all of us are encouraged at 7 o'clock to step outside the doors of our homes or wherever we may be, uh, to give generic applause to all of those uh, first responders that have done so much for us. As many people as we lost, we will have lost many, many more people if it weren't for the nurses and the doctors and the technicians, uh, the EMS individuals that rushed people to medical concern, the police and fire that stepped in the breach, and all of the other individuals that did so much to help us get through this to this point. And all of that we're going to commemorate this Wednesday, March 3rd. Now I'm pleased to ask uh, Mayor Pickenich to join us. Uh, Mayor Gina Pickenich, very active member of her community's business community, active in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, was known as a community activist before she stepped into the role as mayor. Uh, she's been a terrific partner to work with. And as I mentioned, all of the communities of Westchester County have their importance, every single one in 45 different municipalities. Uh, Mount Kisco is unique in that while it is a small village ge uh, geographically and by population, it is an economic center for a region of the county that's easily one quarter of our uh, land mass. People come to Mount Kisco from North Salem and Bedford, Pound Ridge, Lewisboro, Somers, and so forth in order to be able to uh, accommodate uh, the everyday living, the shopping, the restaurants, uh, and the other things that uh, they're to offer. So any further ado, Mayor Pickenich, thank you for being with us. Again, my name is Gina Pickenich, and I have the honor of serving the people of Mount Kisco as their mayor. I have to start off by expressing uh, tremendous gratitude and thanks to both the uh, county executive and to the deputy executive. It's, it's very difficult to uh, conceive that we've been a year at this, and it's been a year through a very tumultuous, unknown storm. Uh, and the county executive and uh, all of county government has uh, steered us through that storm. And we at local government try to adjust the sails as best we can, uh, but without their uh, steady and sure hand on the wheel, um, it would have been unimaginable to help our communities make their way through this. So we continue to appreciate the advocacy and the support, and again, the leadership that has been very much needed. So in Mount Kisco on Saturday, we had a great, great opportunity to help people who are traditionally underserved. Uh, partnership with uh, New York State, specifically Brian Hecht out of the governor's office, with Northwell and most specifically Northern Westchester Hospital and their extraordinary leadership there, uh, and with Carola Bracco and those at Neighbors Link. We were able to do a pop-up locally at our Fox Senior Center. And this was so important because the people who were vaccinated were those, again, who are traditionally underserved. These are folks who don't have resources or computers to be able to make appointments. Um, they don't have transportation to leave our community to get down to the county center or to go to other places in order to be vaccinated. Uh, the sooner that we can get seniors in our community vaccinated, the sooner we can get back to full services in person offered at our senior center. It goes beyond the disease. It goes to mental health, physical well-being, um, the socialization that is so very important. Um, so we made 
great progress this weekend, and we're appreciative to have had that opportunity. Um, it continues to be very challenging for people across Westchester and for people in our village. Uh, unfortunately, folks are still contracting the virus. But having said that, we're starting to turn the corner. Uh, Friday's report indicated that we're down to 39 active cases in our village, which is tremendous progress. Um, this is largely due to the adherence uh, to the COVID guidelines of the people in our village, uh, also to people who have been visiting and to the businesses. Um, with better weather on the horizon, we certainly expect that we're going to be seeing those number of cases reduced and, of course, with additional vaccinations. Um, our existing businesses in our community, as the county executive mentioned, we are a hub of activity throughout Northern Westchester. Our existing businesses have been very creative in finding safe ways to ensure that they can continue to deliver services to their clients, but also um, to keep their businesses afloat. Um, just in the past two weeks, we're really starting to again see some stimulation in our local economy. We actually welcomed five new businesses to Mount Kisco last week, and those include the Clean Bedroom, the Shaky Crab, Bella's Bakery, Athleta, and expatriates from around the county are coming to the British Hamlet uh, for their, their favorite uh, goods from the UK. So our beautiful village continues to be, again, a center uh, for visiting, dining, uh, shopping throughout northern Westchester, and the um, good people of Mount Kisco continue to persevere, exercising patience, uh, exercising restraint, uh, carefully following safety precautions, um, and continuing to be responsible for their actions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. We're very happy to have you with us. Uh, the mayor was with us earlier during the pandemic, and we've had a number of her colleagues, village mayors, town supervisors, large city mayors with us, and uh, we intend to invite as many of them back uh, sequentially so they can talk about what's happening in their communities. Westchester uh, is broken into 45 different municipalities, as small as the 2,000 people in the village of Buchanan and as large as the 200,000 people in the city of Yonkers. Each one has their own personality. Each one has their own uh, assets and, and their own uh, things that they have to try to uh, achieve during their time, and, and the county is trying very hard to be a good partner to each of these municipalities and, and uh, work with them and through them to accomplish things, because you can live in a jurisdiction of uh, Mount Kisco and at the same time live in the jurisdiction of Westchester, and those governments ought to coordinate our efforts together. We do our best, and Madam Mayor, thank you for being such a good partner to us, to us all. I'm going to close uh, my uh, general comments here to uh, note that uh, Westchester Magazine has uh, publicized in their uh, most recent edition individuals who are identified as healthcare heroes, the people who have stepped forward during this pandemic to go above and beyond just the normal responsibilities of their job and to really do a, a terrific job uh, on behalf of all of us. And uh, one of the people they spotlighted is our first deputy commissioner of uh, public health of the health department, Renee Recchia. And we want to recognize Renee for her outstanding work. Uh, she is a mother of two sons, uh, but yet she spends a lot of late nights and weekends working here in this job to help us roll out testing as the initial part of the pandemic. And now the vaccination program, she's been uh, just, you know, tremendously diligent in trying to take care of uh, all of the different things that come across her path. Uh, she works under the direction of a Dr. Charlita Amla, who's the commissioner of that department, and she has a number of other individuals who serve in, in top-level positions. It's a terrific team there. They've been overworked now for a solid year, and uh, it looks like we've got some more months ahead of us. But she's one of the people that's been identified. There are many other uh, outstanding awards going to other individuals from different locations, Dr. Renee Garrett at uh, the Westchester Medical Center, Dr. Amir Rabati at St. John Riverside Hospital, Dr. Sheila Nolan from Boston Children's Maria Ferrara Hospital, Dr. Tracy Gardner of Children's Village, on and on and on. Uh, my friend Rita Mabley, who is a CEO at the United Hebrew of New Rochelle. So many wonderful people that have been uh, recognized by Westchester Magazine, and we're very proud that Renee Recchia is one of those individuals. She's done a terrific job, 
and she's done her job before our administration came into office. She'll be here, as, I'm sure, as long as she wants, and uh, we're very happy for her. Congratulations, Renee. So with that, we'll go to any questions that we have from the press. Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communications, is at the ready. What do we have, Catherine? Right, we have a number of questions today. The first question comes from Julia Perkins. She is a reporter with Hearst Media in Connecticut. She asks, uh, Connecticut opted to open eligibility by age group. What do you think of this idea, and what's been effective and or challenging about how New York has opened eligibility? Well, it's, it, it's interesting because every state, 50 states in the union, have each set up their own, uh, uh, their own structures. And, and, of course, it's, uh, it's a subject of serious comparison when you are in close proximity to a state border. So we live adjacent to Connecticut, and we're not that far from New Jersey, basically a baseball throw. Uh, and so what uh, Governor Lamont has done in Connecticut, what Governor Murphy has done in New Jersey, and what Governor Cuomo has done in New York uh, have some similarities, but they also have some differences. Uh, in our state, we opened up the age eligibility at 65 and above. In Connecticut, I believe it's 55. And so clearly for those people who are in that area, 55 to 65, what Connecticut has done has been very uh, supportive. I'm not sure of some of the other categories that Connecticut has. Um, we in New York will vaccinate a person who works in New York, even if they live in Connecticut or in any other state. New Jersey is the other most likely one in this area of the state. So I think our sense is, is that <clears throat> to the extent that Connecticut may do the same for a New York resident who works in Connecticut, I had that privilege for a number of years back in the 90s when I worked uh, based out of Stanford, Connecticut. Um, hopefully that kind of cooperation across the border is there. Uh, the second half of the question, just repeat it again, Catherine, so I can... Sure. So she wanted to know... Um, what do you think of the, has it, has it been effective the way we have rolled out vaccination and what has been challenging about it? Well, I think the challenging part is pretty easy to highlight. It's just the lack of, of, uh, volume of doses. If we had the doses, uh, that, that would satisfy the demand, then the rollout would have been easier. The rollout, you know, started out first few days bumpy. There's no question about it. As we tried to get down uh, in each of the different locations where there's vaccinations to try to figure out how are we going to handle the physical logistics of people coming in with appointments. Uh, we've had a couple of snowstorms that have made it challenging on specific days. We've had to go through uh, a really rough responsibility to uh, uh, restructure, reschedule appointments when some reason has, uh, has been caused where we had to cancel appointments. Weather was a factor, weather here in New York was a factor, and then sometimes not being able to get the vaccine in from out of town was a factor that impacted our ability to give out the vaccines in time. So that was a challenging element as well. I think, I think we've done increasingly better with each passing day. So uh, on any given day, there might be uh, a line someplace, there might be some incident. Uh, some of the local pharmacies, uh, you know, have difficulty handling the logistics because they really weren't built to be a vaccination facility. Um, and when you have the normal flu shots, which is plentiful for everybody that wants one, you don't feel the urgency to get it today. You can get it tomorrow. With the, the COVID vaccines, people are in a great urgency to get it because they see the potential for serious illness and or fatality, and so therefore the demand is very strong. But I think in general, given the parameters of this, we've done reasonably well. Now, it's just like people who lose their power in a, in a power outage. Until you get your power back, you're not happy, and rightfully so. But the minute a person gets their power back, the issue, which was the number one issue in their mind, restore power, drops off the chart because now they're back to, you know, living their life in a certain way. And I've seen this interesting, you know, situation now where the many people have gotten their first shot, the anxiety calms down. They believe now that they're on the road to being properly protected. They get the second shot. We've seen almost no reactions to people. There's a lot of fear. Oh, if I take the shot. And they've heard stories and they've seen stuff on the Internet which has spooked them. Uh, but now that process calms down. You get the first shot. You get the second shot. Now you feel comfortable. You still show diligence with masks and social distancing, but you begin to have more of a normal life. You go out and have a meal out and do certain things that you wouldn't have done otherwise. So I think it's really, again, a question of how fast we can get the vast majority of people vaccinated. The faster we do that, the more we have normalcy, the longer that process takes, the more anxious people who have yet to be vaccinated will be. And at this stage of the game, even though Connecticut lowered it down to 55, there's still a large number of people who are 35 and 40 and 45 and who want to be able to have the vaccine. So we're dealing in a world of, of scarce product and high demand, and we're trying to manage it as best as we can. 
The next question comes from Samantha Crawford from News 12 Westchester. She asks, are you expecting any doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine to come to Westchester? And if so, do you know how many or when? Uh, Samantha Crawford from News 12 with that question. We don't know, uh, Samantha, exactly uh, what dosage we're going to get. The state will determine how much doses we get in each week's allocation. <clears throat> we just mentioned the, the week, al week 12 allocation. Uh, and they will let us know if we have Johnson & Johnson product. Obviously, as much Johnson & Johnson product as we get is easier to administer because you're dealing with a one-shot scenario. You don't have to make a second shot uh, you know, request or requirement. Uh, some people have been concerned, you know, about the relative efficacy. And uh, as a layman, when I read what I read about it, the, the level of efficacy might be slightly below the other two models, but it's still very high and very likely to protect you from the potential for fatality or the potential from serious infection that might send you to a hospital for an extended period of time. So uh, I'm, I'm confident that when Johnson & Johnson, the, the, the cohort of that vaccine is in New York State and we're, we're administered it, we're in a better position. And I think that'll help us move through it more quickly. But we don't have any specifics yet about when that's going to hit our door. You, t you just touched on that a bit, but she wants you to expand on uh, the difference in the single dose vaccine with less cold transport and storage, how that's going to impact vaccinating people. Well, certainly it's, it's easier to have uh, the Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in that they don't require super cold storage. The Pfizer vaccine does. It's easier to have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it's a one-shot delivery. Moderna and Pfizer are two-shot deliveries. Uh, those, are, those are both obvious physical, uh, logistical advantages that we have with one type versus another type of, uh, of vaccine. Um, I have not heard of any appreciable difference from the people that have been vaccinated heretofore by either Moderna or Pfizer. People don't walk around saying, I'm a Pfizer guy, I'm a Moderna guy. Uh, I'm vaccinated is the way it looks. And uh, what we're obviously watching for is any reinfection and, and the protection from infection. That's really the key as to efficacy from our standpoint. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, the differences between the, um, between the various vaccines as the Johnson & Johnson gets out now uh, will become great conversation. You know, when, when you're sitting talking with somebody, maybe over a cup of coffee, socially distanced, you know, you'll compare notes about what your vaccine was like versus another's. I don't think it makes a functional difference for us. Uh, again, there are logistical advantages, but at the end of the day, we'll take more of any of those three and any other ones that the FDA approves. With the, with the new Yonkers Center, we hope that we'll be able to get out uh, with maybe additional large centers in a few places. We hope that we'll be able to have a mobile unit of vaccination to deal with our homebound residents, of which that is still an unmet need. Uh, you know, and uh, if we could wave a magic wand, we'd have a, a major uh, vaccination center in the northwest part of the county to serve the Peekskill, Austin, Cortland corridor. Uh, we know that Gina's in our ear about getting up in the northeastern corridor of the county. Mount Kisco would be a very logical place. Um, my friends in New Rochelle want whatever Yonkers and White Plains gets, and Mount Vernon wants whatever New Rochelle wants. Mount Vernon, and, and then there's the rest of the Sound Shore. So everybody, everybody wants and are ready to uh, open up the right doors to do that. And so we're prepared to, you know, cooperate and help make that happen. And I think you've seen a major improvement, I have certainly, in the last month. From, uh, from the end of January to the end of February, all of a sudden there's more product out there. And we went through a couple of snowstorms during that time frame. I expect we're going to see significant progress in March and even more progress in April. And then just like the analogy I used a second ago, once the power is restored everywhere, then uh, people are comfortable and we, we have that normalcy come back in. And I think the more we vaccinate people, the more they'll feel that sense of, uh, of normalcy and comfort. Okay. And the next question, which is also the last question for for today is from David Proper from the Journal News. He asks, are you more pleased with the vaccine allotment coming to Westchester over the last week or so? I am, David. David Proper from LOHUD, the Journal News. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm pleased that Westchester is getting additional allocation of a vaccine. In addition to the 2,500, we're getting 900 more for senior distribution. I think it's credit to those individuals in our in our county government that have done a terrific job in setting up the logistics, making sure that we have sufficient number of people to get the vaccine shots, that we're dealing with the occupational cohorts that we've been asked to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I want to say Joan McDonald has done a superior job. Emily Saltzman by her side as a deputy. Uh, Aviva Meyer, uh, Susan Spear, uh, Christopher Steers, 
Uh, there's a number of other people. I know the minute you start to name some folks, you leave some folks out. We've already credited Renee Recchia and Dr. Amler and the, and the health department. And so I think we're, we're showing that when given the opportunity to receive a quantity of doses, we get them out there. There's no, um, there's no lost uh, uh, doses because we couldn't administer ourselves properly. Nothing's perfect. We get some concerns every day, but we get a hell of a lot of compliments, too, from people who are pleased with the way these things have operated. And, and, you know, I get a couple of emails a day. And trust me, in the line of work that I'm in, you hear the negative immediately, immediately. You don't always hear the positive. And when someone stops to say thank you, now I accept the thanks on behalf of the organization. I, I am not out there vaccinating anybody. I did not lay out the logistics. I had the good wisdom to appoint capable and qualified people to do those things within this government. And that is the responsibility of the CEO of any company, not to, uh, you know, to, do the, to do the work all by themselves, but to get a team of people. And we have that. And so I do think that the state recognizes that. And I think that's why we have the additional doses. But you're tested every day. And when you're tested every day, whatever we've done up to this minute of time, we're subject to how well we function the rest of today, how well we function tomorrow, the day after that, and, uh, you know, and forward we go. I, I remember an anecdote, and I'll close with this since that was the last question. I often tell stories of uh, the wisdom of my father, and I talk about him, Stanley Latimer, Stan Latimer, blue-collar fellow, uh, head of maintenance, uh, Beach Point Club in Mamanic. Very blunt man, uh, a man who could use two words to say what I would take two paragraphs to say. So in that regard, we're very different people. But um, in, this particular, in this particular anecdote, and, it, and it, it informs me today about this concept of being tested, I was, uh, uh, I was sitting at the, the kitchen table doing my homework in eighth grade. I had algebra, and I had difficulty with algebra. I had a tough teacher. She was very demanding, and she was good to be demanding. But, you know, I found it difficult. And uh, what she would do is give us a test, a, a quiz, every Friday, every Friday a quiz, that uh, we had to pass. And there was two grades on the quiz, 100 or zero, meaning you had to get it perfectly, every, every number right. And if you get even one wrong, you had to take the quiz the next week. And of course, uh, anybody, I guess I was whatever I was at that point, at 13 years old, whatever, whatever age I was, it was unfair. You know, how many, how many times in that age category do you say, that's unfair, that's not fair, get accustomed to life, George, it's not fair. But um, in this particular case, I was kind of moping, as 13-year-old kids do. And I was trying to study. I was having a tough time. And my father came across, you know, walked through the kitchen, not big kitchen, and he saw me there at the table, you know, moping. And, and he said, what are you doing? And I told him, I said, I'm studying algebra. I got a quiz every Friday. It's not fair. I said, and then I looked at him, and I said, getting tested every week. And he looked at me as if I was the dumbest person that existed on the planet. He took his hand and he pounded it on the table. He shook the table and he had that power. And he looked at me and he said, tested every week? He said, boy, when you're a man, you're going to get tested every day. And he pounded the table again. He said, study that. So A, I was afraid of my father. I loved him, but I was afraid of him. And I figured, you know, I was going to have to keep taking this test unless I studied it. That particular Friday, I got the 100 I needed to get off the rope. But that story is always in my mind. All those years later, He's long gone, and I'm, an, I'm as old today as he was then, older. Uh, but I remember the idea of being tested every day. Every day, this government is tested. Every day, we have to treat sewerage. We can't do it great for a year or two years or three years and then break down the system and fail to treat the sewerage. We cannot run the bus system reliably and then stop running it reliably. We can't afford to have uh, capable people managing the ground at the airport and then all of a sudden fail to do that. We have to make the test every single day. And in terms of what our, our public health department has done, those folks in public safety that are helping out with the logistics around the county center and other places, our clinic, the people who work in our parks department who are on the ground at the county center helping make those things, we're tested every day. And I'm very proud of the men and women of this county government. They don't work for me. They work for you, as do I. And they put the time and the energy and the effort in And I'm impressed by their professionalism. That's why I'm so happy when Renee is being recognized by her uh, you know, by a public entity, Westchester Magazine, because we are, in fact, tested every day. And so today, Monday, March 1st, is a test, and so will be tomorrow, and so will Wednesday, and we'll keep on going. We'll be back with you on Wednesday for the uh, Ribbons of Remembrance ceremony, 11 o'clock here in this building. I assume we'll be broadcasting it here on uh, Facebook. Uh, then on Thursday, we'll give the update again at 2 o'clock. And I want to again thank always Ken Jenkins, Deputy County Executive, and particularly uh, Mayor Gina Pickenich from Mount Kisco for being with us today. Thank you both very much. Thank you all for watching. We wish you a very safe day and uh, take care. And we'll get through this. We'll get through this together. Thanks very much.